Amen. So Matthew chapter 7, we're moving along through the book of Matthew every Thursday night, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and tonight we'll be in Matthew 7. And of course, Matthew 7, 1 is probably, um, I've heard some people say, and I probably would agree with this to some degree, that, that that's probably one of the more common verses that you'll hear quoted today, is, judge not that ye be not judged. Uh, I was listening to a preacher a little while back, and he was saying that he'd heard another preacher say that it used to be that the most commonly uh, quoted verse was John 3.16, and that they'd done some studies and statistics, and now it turns out that Matthew 7.1 is now the most quoted verse. I don't know whether or not that's true, but I'll tell you one thing. I've heard a lot of people quote Matthew 7.1 to me. A lot of times if, I, 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 if I'm uh, out soul winning or knocking a door and you start to say John 3.16 to somebody, you start to quote it, they can sometimes finish it for you or they're familiar with the verse. But John 7, or Matthew 7, 1 is, is one that I've actually had people just quote to me just, you know, uh, without being prompted. It seems like it's a verse a lot of people know. At least they know the verse, maybe not where it is. They won't tell you, you know, Matthew 7, 1. You know, they'll just say, well, you know, the Bible says, judge not, right? And it, is it the most quoted verse? I, I'm not sure, but it certainly is something I've heard a lot. Now, the thing is that the, the people that quoted the most, I think, often are a lot of very lukewarm Christians. Those are the type of people that, will, that I've heard quote this. You'll see them on Facebook posts, you know, when a preacher's getting in trouble for something he preached and a lot of uh, the world's just piling on him. You'll see a lot of these, you know, so-called Christians or these lukewarm Christians, they'll jump in and start to berate this man of God who's just taking a stand for the Word of God and say, you know, you shouldn't judge people. Jesus said, don't judge. You know, judge not. And when they quote this verse, they often only quote that first part of the verse, right? Just judge not. And that's where they kind of, a lot of times, they leave that off. And uh, the misunderstanding and the, the, the wrong application becomes apparent when you actually start to read this verse in context. You know, that's always a great principle when you're actually going to, you know, quote the Bible to actually know what you're talking about by getting that verse in context. So I know that's kind of a profound concept for some people, but, you know, when you start to read the, the context here, what he's saying here, he's not saying don't judge people. He's saying we shouldn't judge people and be a hypocrite about it. The context here is not being a hypocrite. It's not not judging. You know, God does implore us to judge. You know, we'll talk about that a little bit later. That judges that judging is something that God's children should be doing. You know, that is something we should be doing. The Bible does say that. But uh, again, like I said, we'll talk about that as we get on the sermon. But what the context of Matthew seven one is this: is don't be a hypocrite when you judge. That's what he's talking about here. If you look at verse two, it goes on and says. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? So he's talking about a hypocrite. Somebody he's gonna look at a mote, and the mote just means like a speck, like a sliver, like just a little particle that's gotten in somebody's eye. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, Why are you, you know, beholding the mote that is in your brother's eye? Saying, Hey brother, you got this little piece of sawdust in your eye. Let me get that out of you. You know, trying to point out some little sin in somebody else's life or some error in somebody else's life when you have this giant beam in your own eye. I mean, try and imagine doing anything with a beam in your eye. You know, I mean, just this, this is the picture he's painting here of just this giant beam in your eye. You know, it's hard to really accurately see how to do anything if you had a beam in your eye. He says, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye. And then he goes on, and here's where we get the context. He says, but thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thy own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So hypocrisy is the primary application of this, of this passage, of these verses. Now, people in their defense uh, of, of their, their right or their duty to judge, They'll say, you know, what they'll say, you know, God wants us to judge, you know, because that's kind of what's under attack. You know, people are saying we shouldn't judge anybody, that we should never, you know, say anything negative about anybody ever. And in people's defense saying, no, the Bible does say we should judge. A lot of times those people that are trying to defend that position are saying we should be able to judge others. The Bible tells us to judge others. I mean, even here in this in this in this uh, these verses, it's telling us to, to judge there. He's saying, you know, after you get the beam out, then go get them out. Right? Those people uh, that want to defend that correct biblical position of being able to judge, sometimes we get a little too zealous for that and we forget about what the primary application of these verses is, which is that we should not be hypocrites when we judge. And that's really the message here. It's not just, hey, you should go judge people. 
I mean, we aren't supposed to judge. We're supposed to judge righteous judgment. We should be able to take the Bible and see what's before us and compare spiritual things with spiritual and make decisions and wise discernments. And we judge all the time, whether we realize it or not. But when we do that, the primary application here is that we don't be a hypocrite about it. <clears throat> now, I'll read to you. If you would, go to Proverbs chapter 11. Go to Proverbs chapter 11. This is something that the Bible condemns, is, is hypocrisy, being a hypocrite. It's not something that we should want uh, to be. Uh, we should never want to be labeled a hypocrite. You know, it's, it's a very sad and unfortunate thing if we were ever found in, those, in that position. The Bible says in Romans 2.1, thou, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou, thou art that judgest. Okay, and it doesn't end there. The sentence goes on. He says, Whoso, whoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. That's what's inexcusable. The fact that you would judge another and at the same time condemn yourself. For that thou judgest, thou doest the same things. He's not saying here, Paul isn't saying don't judge people. He's saying don't be a hypocrite. Don't condemn yourself when you judge another by being guilty of the same thing that you're judging another for. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. So God's even saying here that if you're a hypocrite, you know, there's a judgment that God has. You know, if we're, if we're, if we're found guilty of judging people for things that we ourselves are guilty of, you know, especially as, as pastors or preachers or people who get up and boldly proclaim the word of God, and then it's found out that we've been guilty of the same things that we've just been uh, you know, <clears throat> condemning others for, you know, look out. There's the God, there's a, there is a judgment that comes with that. God is not pleased with that. God is not happy about that. We should never want to be guilty of being hypocrites. That's what Matthew 7 is starting out at, uh, telling us about, is the, is the fact that we should never want to be hypocrites. We should have to be very careful. Yes, we should judge, but make sure that we are not guilty of those things. If you're there in Proverbs chapter 11, we're going to look at verse 9. You know, he's saying, well, what's the big deal about being a hypocrite? Well, look at Proverbs chapter 11, verse 9. An hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. That's a powerful verse. I mean, would you want to be guilty of destroying your neighbor? I mean, if someone were to come lay that charge at you, you would say, hey, you know what? You destroyed your neighbor. Now, what's it saying here? Like, did you actually went over there with the flame blower and burn their house down? No. <laughs> what I believe it's talking about is spiritually speaking. I mean, we th can think of lost people, unsaved people, the world, how they just reject Christianity today. They want nothing to do with church. They want nothing to do with the Bible. They don't want, when you go knock on their door to try and tell them the gospel, give them the gospel, invite them to church, they say, no, thank you. They don't want to hear it. Why? Because they've seen a lot of hypocrites. Because hypocrites, there's a lot of them. People who are saying one thing and doing another. People who are judging people for something and then being guilty of that same thing. There's a lot of hypocrisy that's out there. And the hypocrite destroys his neighbor because when that person sees the hypocrisy that's taking place in the name of Jesus Christ, they get put off. They say, you know what, I don't want anything to do with this. I mean, I can think of a guy that I was talking to last, just this last Sunday. We went down and sat in his, in his living room and I gave him the gospel and he kind of stopped me in the middle and he had questions. He said, why is it that some Christians, you know, they say they claim the name of Christ, they say they're going to heaven when they're going to die, they say they believe the Bible, but they live these wicked lives. I said, you know what, that's unfortunate. You know, that you're, you're right, that's sad. I wish that wasn't the case. But I reminded him again that, you know, going to heaven is not based on how you believe or what you do. It's based on what you believe. Amen. It's not about, you know, it's unfortunate there's people out there that want to just, you know, well, I'm going to heaven, it doesn't matter how I live, I can do whatever I want. Yeah, you can do that and still go to heaven, but you know what, in, that pro in the process of you just living however you want as a Christian and doing whatever you want and just satisfying your flesh and just, you end up being a hypocrite, and what do you end up doing? Yeah. You end up destroying your neighbor. So don't take being a hypocrite lightly. It's, it's something that's very severe, you know, and if it's something that we've been guilty of in the past, we should just determine to never do it again. You know, it, it's something that uh, the lost reject Christianity over, that they want nothing to do with because they're put off by Christians who say one thing and do another. So the admonishment here in Matthew chapter 7 is not that we should never judge. That's not what he's saying here. He said you should never, you know, judge not. You know, the verse goes on. You know, and then there's several verses after it that make it very clear that the admonishment here is not that we should never judge, but that we shouldn't be hypocrites when we judge. <clears throat> he says there in Matthew chapter 7, if you keep something in Proverbs, if you haven't left there already, keep something in Proverbs, we'll be back. 
But it says in Matthew 7, verse 5, where we read, it says, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt clearly see to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So the, the admonition is, is not, don't judge, it's, you know what, get, your, get yourself right. Get the beam out of your eye, and then go and help your brother get <clears throat> the mote out of his eye. Now, what I don't want people to, because people say, man, I really don't want to be a hypocrite. Man. They don't want to ever, you know, and I think, especially if you're somebody who's ever going to do any kind of preaching, because the Bible pretty much covered, it covers everything. There isn't a sin or a topic in life that the Bible doesn't address. So, you know, we're all sinners. So if we're going to be somebody who gets up and preaches the Word of God, we're probably going to end up preaching against something that we may have been guilty of at some point in our life. I mean, it's going to happen. It's a 100% chance of that. So what I don't want people to get the impression is that I'm, I'm not saying that if you've ever been guilty of something, that you can never judge that or say that's wrong. Okay? It's you shouldn't be doing that while you're judging somebody else. You know, if you've done some sin in the past, but you've got it out of your life, and it's no longer a part of your life, you know, you can say, you know what, that's not, I don't do those things anymore. You know, you, it's not hypocritical of you to then say, hey, those things were wrong for somebody to do. Does that make sense? You know, if you were, if you were, I, what's the real comments in just drinking? Let's say just drinking, you know? If you were somebody who drunk, you drank alcohol, you got drunk, and, you know, the Bible condemns drinking, you know, it says, look down on the wine, we'd give it the color of the cup, you know, that we shouldn't be drunks that we should not be filled with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, if you were at one time a drunk and you stopped drinking, it's okay for you to go out and say, hey, drinking's wrong. Mm -hmm. Hey, you should quit drinking. Hey, you shouldn't be a drunk. That's not what I'm saying. But you shouldn't be, you know, stumbling out of the bar, you know, and, and with a bottle in your hand and say, hey, you shouldn't be a drunk. <laughs> you know, when you're doing it, that's the hypocrisy of it, yep. right? So that's, not, that's what I'm trying to get across here, is that it's okay to judge something that you might have been guilty of in your past as long as you're not doing it anymore. <laughs> I mean, you, you say, well, I don't know about that. Well, consider the Apostle Paul himself. I mean, look yeah. at the things that he wrote. Look at all the things that he condemned in scriptures. A guy who was, you know, a destroyer that destroyed the church. Yeah. You know, one who was persecuted the church. Mm -hmm. One who, who was consenting under the death of Stephen. You know, the first martyr, according to scripture. So, I mean, he was one who was able to judge others. I mean, he, he wrote to Romans. He was condemning the, the hypocritical Jews. He himself at one time was, was, was a hypocritical Jew. He was, you know, the tribe of Benjamin. So, judging is not something that is condemned in Scripture. Us judging another person, don't let the world fool you. Don't let this lukewarm Christianity brainwash you. Don't let this, you know, this culture that we live in, live in today think that you're wrong somehow if you judge something. Or if you say, hey, that's wrong. Or that's not right. Or that person's wicked. You know, the Bible condemns a lot of people. The Bible has some very negative and hard things to say about mankind. And so is God wrong to have written these things? You know, of course not. We know that's not the case. If you're there in Proverbs chapter 31, I just want to look at some, at some verses tonight where it actually tells us that judging others is not condemned in Scripture. Actually, it's actually something that's praised and something that's actually commended in Scripture, to judge. I mean, God did write a book called Judges, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I recall correctly. And those guys in the book of Judges were all, you know, heroes of the faith. I mean, they're lifted up in Hebrews 11. A lot of the judges who did a lot of judging in the Old Testament, right? Look at Proverbs 31. We'll see where judging at others is not condemned in scriptures. Proverbs 31 verse 8 says, Open thy mouth for the dumb and the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. You know, boy, would to God we had some people that would judge that way. Would to God we had some you know, leaders in our country today that would stand up and, and, and plead the cause for the poor and needy. You know, instead of everything else that they're pleading the cause for. You know, that would be, that would be some righteous judgment, wouldn't it? Isaiah 16, you can go over, to, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Go to 1 Corinthians 6 and I'll read some more verses to you. That show us that judging is not condemned in Scripture. It says in Isaiah 16, Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Now I love how he builds up to this. Where he's saying, make you clean. Put away the evil, right? Get the beam out of your eye. Don't be a hypocrite. <clears throat> Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. He's saying seek judgment. That's supposed to be something that we should go after. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. So we see again where the Bible is speaking very uh, positively about people judging. 
And even Jesus Himself said in, in the book of John, uh, chapter, or chapter 7, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Mm -hmm. He said, when you judge, judge righteous judgment. Don't be a hypocrite about it. Make sure you yourself are right with God before you judge. The Bible says, you're there in 1 Corinthians 6, I'll read it from 1 Corinthians 5, For what have I to judge them also that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? He's like, well, you know, why are you... Of course, this is in context of 1 Corinthians 5 where you know, you've got people in the church that, that are committing sins that, you know, like fornication, one that you know, would even have his own, his own father's uh, wife, and he was saying you know, to cast one out for the destruction of the flesh, to deliver him unto Satan, to kick him out of the church, and, you know, and that we're not to fellowship with you know, drunkards and fornicators and extortioners and covetous, and that we're not to have any fellowship with them. He's saying, you should be judging these people. He said, what have I to judge them also that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? You know, not to go out and uh, defraud our, our brethren. That's which, what, what it gets into in 1 Corinthians 6. It says, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints? He's saying, you know, if you guys get have some kind of legal dispute, you shouldn't go to the law. That's what he's teaching here. You know, if you guys go out in the parking lot after church night and you back into someone else's car, and you should be able to settle it right there in the parking lot. You know, or not let bring up some lawsuit or something like that, or end up having to go to small claims court. We should be able to settle these things within the house of God. That's what he's saying. You don't want to go to law before the unjust, before the unsaved. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? I mean, don't do any judgment here, you know, but don't judge anybody in the world today. Right? That's what the world would have you to think. But Paul here is saying, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? That one day when we rule and reign with Christ in His kingdom, that we'll actually judge the world. Amen. So why not? I mean, you might as well just get used to it and start doing it now. You know, you might as well break the Bible out and look at the world and compare it to what Scripture says and say, I judge that to be not good. I judge that to be evil. This is good. This is bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he goes on and says, Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more than th how much more things that pertain to this life? I mean, if we're going to judge the world, if we're going to judge angels, shouldn't we also be judging the things that pertain to this life? If ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, no, not one, that shall be able to judge between his brethren? He's even saying here, it would be a shame if there was nobody found in the church that could judge. Mm -hmm. He's saying, I speak this to your shame. Isn't there anybody in the church that can do some judgment? That could say this person is wrong, this person is right, and just let you know, let it fall where it may, and just say you know, tough, like it or lump it. That's what's right. That's what's wrong. That's judgment. Mm -hmm. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians fourteen or First Corinthians fourteen. Paul talks a lot about judgment. First Corinthians. He admonishes people to judge. He even says in First Corinthians ten, he says, "I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say." He's saying, you know what? Judge what I'm saying, even. Judge my preaching. Judge the things that I've written on you. Judge the things that I've taught you, Paul say. Uh, he's saying, I want you to judge what I'm saying. He wants you to you know, compare spiritual things with spiritual things. He wants you to be like the Bereans you know, and search the Scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. And, and, the, and the, uh, you know, the, the, the spirit of the prophets is a subject under the prophets. We ought to judge what we're being taught from the pulpit. We ought to judge what we're hearing at a local church and compare it to the Bible and make sure that it's right. That's what Paul's admonishing these people to do. Judge what I say, he's saying. 1 Corinthians 14, look at verse 29. Let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. Again, he's saying, let these prophets speak, let these preachers get out and preach, and let those that are listening judge what they're hearing. So we see this whole attitude of judge not is, is wrong. Where we're never supposed to judge, where we're never supposed to condemn anything, that is unbiblical. And then here's another phrase, you know, talking about judgment. You hear this a lot. You'll see this on the, you know, this is the, the new cool decal on the back. This is what people are getting tattooed on now. <laughs> Only God can judge me. Right? Only God can judge me. Well, that's right and that's wrong. Okay? First of all, it's wrong because we just talked about how the saints are to judge. Right? How we can judge other people. And how we're admonished to judge. Right? Now, let me assure you the right and the fact that God will judge you. Make, make no mistake about it. They're like, only God can judge me. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, He is. God is going to judge you. That ought to strike fear into you. That ought to make you think about things, not just, you know, make a cool graphic on a t-shirt or something like that. 
Right. <laughs> you know, when you talk about God judging people, you go to Revelation 20, you don't have to go there. But what does he say happens there when the books were opened, right? And the dead were judged out of those things. That's right. And they were judged every man according to their works. You know, and some people were found to be condemned and cast in the lake of fire. I mean, that's frightening. Only God can judge me. You better, you better think about what you're saying when, when, you, when people say things like that. That's not, that's not just a catchy slogan. That's a, that's a spiritual reality that people need to come to grips with. <clears throat> well, God will judge you, but you know, so yeah, only God can judge me. Yeah, He will judge you, but yeah, it's, all, it's wrong in the sense to say that only God can do that. Because as we read earlier, we will judge the world. You know, we will judge angels. We will judge things that pertain unto this life. We will judge righteous judgment, as the Bible admonishes us to do. <clears throat> now, we just don't judge people for things that we do. You know, we're not. We shouldn't be going out and saying, "Hey, you shouldn't be doing this when we're doing it." And uh, it's funny that people that are usually most opposed to judgment are people, the people that like to just throw up that Matthew 7, 1, like some kind of slogan, judge not, you know. I've always, the people I've heard quote that the most are usually just very, very liberal, not, not even Christians, opposed to the Bible, opposed to things of God, but they know that verse. They got that part of that verse down, judge not. That's what they say a lot. But and it's funny that the people who throw that out the most and the ones that are most opposed to people judging anybody, judging anybody, are usually the ones that are guilty. It's usually because it's it's you know it's chafing their own conscience. It's something that they don't want judgment because they don't want to get judged. They say, Don't judge me, bro. You know? Why? Because I'm guilty, bro. Now if you go over to Exodus chapter two, uh, we'll take a look at this. This is something interesting when you read through the scripture, you'll see people, you know, the wicked or people that are doing wrong. You know, getting after somebody else about them judging and, and saying, oh, don't judge me, man. And Genesis, you're going to Exodus 2, but I'll look at uh, Genesis 19. Uh, of course, Genesis 19 is Lot in, in Sodom, right? Where the two angels come to visit uh, Lot in Sodom. And, they, and the men of the city gather around and they say, bring out those men which are, you know, have come in to sojourn with thee that we may know them. Of course, we know what he's alluding to when he says know them. He's actually had physical relations with them. Very wicked men. A city that God destroyed and uses an example for us to, to them that would thereafter live ungodly. So, you know, and what is, what, of course, what does Lot say? He says, you know, brethren, do not so wickedly. You know, and he offers him his, his daughters. You know, that, I'm not saying that was the right thing to do. Lot was obviously not a, a great shining example of, of the Christian life. But... What, did they, what was their response? If you recall, what was the response of those wicked men when Lot said, hey, don't do that. Don't, don't do that to these men. They're, they, you know, they're under my, my roof. You know? And they said, uh, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. <laughs> they're saying, don't judge us, Lot. You know, now you're going to get it worse than we were going to do to them. You know, it just makes them mad, the fact that somebody would stand up and say, hey, what you're doing is wicked. Do not so wickedly, brethren. He's judging them. You know, he's calling them out and saying, what you're thinking about doing, what you want to do, is wicked. And they're saying, ah, you know, you're going to be a judge. Who made you a judge? You know, who died and made you a referee? You know? And now, they, now they're going to get, they just get mad. They're like, we're going to do even worse with you. And uh, we'll look at another example here in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked out on their burdens and espied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And he went out the second day, behold, two men of the, of the Hebrews strode together. And he said unto him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou didst the Egyptian? So when he gets after this Hebrew who's smiting his fellow, he says, hey, man, what are you doing? Knock that off. You know, you guys are brothers. You're supposed to be getting along. What is he like? Oh, you're right, Moses. Man, I'm sorry. Let me get that right. No, he said, uh, he said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? You know, he says, why are you judging? So we see this concept where people who are objecting to another person judging are often people that are very wicked or often people that are guilty of something, of something they shouldn't be doing. And really, these passages that we read about Lot and about Moses, uh, they, they really illustrate how Matthew 7, verse 6, ties in with our text. Because if you just kind of go over the chapter, verse 6 kind of stands out. It kind of seems like it might just be a, 
like a verse that's just kind of sandwiched in between these two passages. And it might not make sense at first, but it says there in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, he says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. So you read all this thing about not judging and not being a hypocrite, about getting the beam out of your own eye, you know, and then being able to see clearly to cast out the motor that is in thy brother's eye. Then you get to verse 6 and you're kind of like, well, what does he mean by that? Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Now, I think what he's getting at here is that he's, there's some people, it's not worth, they're not worth judging. They might be wrong. They might be doing the wrong thing. And a lot of times when we look out in the world, we see a lot of atrocities. We see a lot of injustices. We see a lot of abominations even taking place. And, you know, the, the, in the flesh, we want to we rise up, you know, and start the next revolution and take, you know what I mean? Or we want to go out and just tell the world that they're wrong. And, but we already know that the whole world lieth in wickedness. You know, and then that, that they are of the, of the wicked one, the devil. And that, that we are living in a, in a fallen world. And that the prince of the power of the air now presently work in the children of disobedience. We understand all that. So it's not our job to just go out and judge every single person around us. You know, especially people that, you know, maybe we're trying to, you know, to, uh, you know uh, in, a, in like a workplace situation, where we're trying to get them to know the Lord and get them to understand. I'm not saying we should just never talk about God. But, you know, maybe before we start jumping down their throat about, Whatever sin they seem to have in their life, you know, they, whatever it might be, you know, they smoke, they drink, they go out and they buy, you know, bottle tickets or something like that. Before we jump down their throat about that, maybe we should just focus on giving them the gospel. Mm -hmm. Because they're just sinners. You know, they're just following, you know, just like we were. We were at one time the children of disobedience. Right. You know, we, we also did those things in times past. Yep. And, and, you know, what got you say, it probably wasn't somebody coming down and saying, hey, you're wicked. Then you need to knock that off and get your clean your life up. And boy, what, what are you thinking here? You know, and, and quit quit doing this, quit doing that. What you got to say was because somebody came and told you about the love of God. When someone came and told you about how Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried in those again, that's what gets you saved. Yeah. So we need to be careful that we don't just go out and cast our pearls before swine. You know, and this might even be where people, you know, or if you, uh, if we were to go out and just, you know, start telling somebody how wicked they were and stuff like that, it's they're, it's not like they're going to get right. They're just going to get mad. They're just going to get angry. But what are they going to do? They're going to turn again and rend you. They're going to come after you. You're just going to incite them. You know, this would be a really good principle to apply on social media. You know, this is where, you know, before they just have these giant flare-ups that take off on Facebook these days, where people, because people just say things on social media now that I don't think they would ever say if that person were standing in the room with them. They just kind of shoot off the mouth, and I'm just thinking, you know, I've been guilty of that in the past. It's something I had to learn. It was like, hey, man. You know, you're not doing anything good here. You're just kind of casting your pearls out there. I mean, maybe what you're saying is right. Maybe what you're saying is good. But all you're doing is just, you know, you're just adding wood to the fire. And you're just stirring up contention. <clears throat> so, you know, we talked a little bit about this uh, last Sunday night. Um, we talked about the obedient ear. And how it's not worth correcting somebody who won't receive correction. This kind of ties in with that. That we shouldn't be casting our pearls before swine. <laughs> we shouldn't be giving our righteous judgment you know, to people who are just going to completely disregard it and even, you know, just, you know, uh, take that as an excuse to, to turn and rend us, you know. The Bible says, speak not in the ears of a fool, right? For he will despise the wisdom of thy words. It says, don't speak in the ears of a fool. Some people are not worth talking to. You know, some people, they just, they're having a bad day, maybe, or they're just they're not in a good mood, or they're just cantankerous people, or they just, they're just looking for a confrontation, they're just looking for a fight. And you come along, and if you feed into that, you know, it's like casting your pearls before swine. You know, it, it's uh, it's giving that which is holy unto the dogs. And at the end of the day, you know, it's not like the, the pig's going to stand upright and, you know, unzip itself and out come a, you know, a shiny, wonderful person. You know, they're going to turn again and rend you, is what the Bible's saying here. But a lot of people, so it's just dealing a lot with judgment tonight and, and not being a hypocrite when you judge. But also understanding that it's perfectly um, okay for us to judge things. You know, at, and at, at the very least, inwardly. You know, sometimes, you know, maybe we shouldn't be casting our pearls before swine. But that doesn't mean that we can't think about saying, think to ourselves, that guy's really wicked. You know, that doesn't mean we have to vocalize that. It doesn't mean we have to go out and make sure they know that's how we feel about them. Of course, there's an appropriate time, you know, when we should rebuke people sharply. But when we kind of read what Paul had to say... 
He was saying, you know, in 1 Corinthians, he was talking more about, you know, judge them that are within. You know, it'd be more important for you to go to a brother in Christ and correct him. You know, judge him and say, hey, I noticed this. You know, did you consider what the Bible says in light of what you're doing? And judge them, you know, and lovingly and kindly rebuke them or reprove them. So why? Because you're not casting before swine. You're, you're casting that judgment, that righteous judgment before somebody who has the Spirit of God. And if they have a tender heart towards the things of God, are likely to receive that correction and get it right. You know, that, that's, that's really where the judgment that we should be more concerned with. Not going out and trying to right every wrong on Facebook. You know, maybe we should be a little bit more concerned about the people that are actually in our lives that we meet on a weekly basis and what they're doing and, and kind of keep each other in check. You know, that's kind of a, that's a great reason to be in church and is to have those relationships. But, you know, people, because here's the thing, at the end of the day, people who say, you know, judge not, don't judge me, only God can judge me, you know, don't judge me, bro, all these things. Um, they're the ones who object to being judged, who, who would just, you know, get upset with you for judging them. When they do that, they, they're really deeming themselves unworthy of being judged. Because when we think about it, being judged is, is something, is a good thing. Yeah. It's a good thing when someone will take you aside and show you. I mean, again, I, I know I'm kind of going back to what I preached Sunday night a little bit about the obedient ear, but, you know, being reproved by a, 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 like a, a godly elder, like someone who's your spiritual elder or somebody who's grown in the faith, taking you aside and showing you something out of the Word of God and, and admonishing you to get it right, that's a good thing. You know, that's something... I mean, think about... What, what if a parent never corrected their child? Just let them run wild. I mean, just crayons all over the wall. You know, I mean, things are getting lit on fire. The dog's half-shaved. I mean, I, I can tell you stories. I know people who did not correct their children. And it was literally like, he's on the stove. There's, you know, he's relieved himself on the stove. The olive oil spill it. I mean, thank goodness he didn't turn it on on the way up, you know. And, all because he had to get to the sprinkles, you know, the dog comes home and the dog's got mustard and Tabasco and ketchup and all the condiments have been dumped out. I mean, just what if you never corrected your child? That's the kind of thing that would start to happen. Mm -hmm. and, we, and people would step back and go, you don't love that kid. What are you doing? Why aren't, well, you're not lovingly chastening your child and bringing him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and teaching him right from wrong. <coughs> So it's the same thing, you know, we should be willing to receive correction, willing to have somebody judge us if they're doing it for the right purposes of showing us how to be better Christians, better whatever it might be, dads, mothers, soul winners, children, whatever it is, church members, to be better people that can better serve God. <clears throat> See, people who object to it, they kind of de deem themselves unworthy of it. And, they, uh, and the wicked, they disdain being judged, don't they? That's what we saw earlier. It's really usually people who are doing wrong, people who are very wicked, who are like, don't judge me. They're the ones that disdain it. They don't want anyone to judge anybody. <clears throat> but we see the complete opposite when it's a righteous person. When it's somebody who's holy and righteous and loves God and loves the things of God, they embrace judgment. They want that judgment. They say, yeah, judge me. And uh, David is an example of this. And if you would, turn over to uh, Psalms 26. Psalm 26. David is a great example of somebody, as the Bible says, a man after God's own heart. And as a result, you know, he is one that welcomed judgment, that God would judge him, that God would search him out and see and, and judge him. If you're there in Psalms 26, look at verse 1, he said, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. So here he is praying and saying and asking God to judge me. He wants to be judged. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. He goes on and says, well, what, is, what do you mean when he says, judge me? What is he talking about? He says, well, examine me, O Lord. That's what he's asking when God judged him, that he would look at his life and, and correct what's wrong and, and, and praise him for what's right. He's saying, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart, for thy loving kindness is before mine eyes. I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. Look at verse 8. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place wherein thy honor dwelleth. So you see a guy here, David, who embraced being judged, prayed for God to judge him. And why was he so bold to pray that? I mean, that could be kind of a, you know, kind of a risky prayer if we weren't too sure about ourselves, to pray and ask God to judge us. I mean, are we, are we that bold tonight to go home and say, you know what, I'm going to ask God to judge me. 
<laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, really, but why was why was why was it that David was able to, to pray such a bold prayer? Because of verse four, I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. He said in verse five, I have hated the congregation of evildoers. Oh, he hated somebody. Yeah. And he asked God to judge him for it. Mm -hmm. And he said, I will not sit with the wicked. He said, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. And he was very confident because he knew he was right with God. And he was able to go home and pray and ask God to judge him. Now we'll move along here in uh, Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7, uh, in verse 7. It kind of, kind of starts to transition out of the topic of you know, judgment and righteous judgment and not being a hypocrite, all those things that we've talked about so far. And he goes on in Matthew chapter 7. In verse 7 it says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find, and knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man of you is there, uh, 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 what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, he will give him a stone. Or if he ask a fish, he will give him a serpent. If ye then, being evil, know how to do, give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good, give, good, give good gifts to them that ask him? Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. You know, so this is kind of just gets into prayer, and he's just kind of saying here, you know, we should be right with God that we might have our prayers answered. You know, if we if we keep the law and the prophets, if we do unto others as we have do to ourselves, you know, that, that we could have our prayers answered. You know, that if if we would seek and ask and knock and make sure that uh, you know we're we're doing those things that we ought to do, that our prayers will be answered, even as he likens it as a as a father would give to his son. You know, if if you if you would ask you a fish. Wouldn't you give him a fish or would you give him a serpent? You know, so it's kind of that same kind of relationship he's kind of alluding to there where, you know, if our children are obeying us and doing what we ask them to do, we're much more likely to give them those things than they ask for. You know, the kid, you know, at least that's the way it should be. You know, the kid that's disobeying and misbehaving all the time isn't going to get to go to the store and pick out a cookie. You know, their mom and dad are going to be a lot less inclined to treat them as something or give them something that they ask. So I don't want to spend uh, a whole lot of time on that, uh, just for the sake of time, but uh, let's go ahead and just jump down to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. Matthew 7 verse 13. It says there in Matthew 7 verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now these are some famous verses. These are verses that I often quote when I'm out, if I'm ever giving somebody the gospel, you know, asking them about, uh, you know, you know, well, we'll get into it here, but these are very famous verses. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But let me just start out by saying, you know, what these verses are and are not teaching. Because these are verses that have been twisted and in the new versions are actually very corrupt to teach a, a false salvation yeah. and, or false things about salvation. Now, it is teaching that there are... And this is a very sobering and hard truth. And this is something a lot of times I'm giving somebody gospel at their door. I'll mention this to them. And this is a lot one of those verses that if somebody's kind of starting to glaze over when, in your gospel presentation, a lot of times this snaps them out of it when you bring the, this up to them. And if that's this, that the fact is that there are more people that are going to go to hell than heaven. That's a sobering fact. That they're literally... I mean, Jesus said, my little flock. That's what he called us. You know, that there's more. And it's not because God doesn't love them. It's because people reject Him, right? And you say, well, I don't know if I agree with that. Well, it says right there, broad is the way which leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in there at. And how does he, what does He uh, contrast that with? The straight gate, the narrow way which leadeth unto life, and that there's few that be to find it. So He's teaching here that there are actually more people going to hell than heaven, unfortunately. That's not because God wants it that way. That's not just because God chose it to be that way. That's, he's just saying that because that's the way it is. That's just the reality of the situation. <clears throat> now, we should never get bitter and mad at God or say, well, that's not fair. 
You know, because God could turn right around at us and, and say, you know, if we say, hey, God, why are you letting all these people go to hell? He could turn right around and say the same thing to us. You know, I've given you the Bible. I've given you, you know, the ability to go out and preach the gospel. You know, I've given you the Holy Spirit. I've commanded you to go out and do it. Preach you the gospel to, you know, to every creature. Go out into all the world and preach it. You know, and we, and we go, well, why is God sending people out? He could say the same thing right back to us. Yeah. Well, why are you doing what I've told you to do? Right. And then we start to understand how important it is to go out and preach the gospel. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> it's not because God wants it the way, it's just because that's the way it is. We know that's not the way God wants it because the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Mm -hmm. All. Everybody. He says He would have all men to be saved. Yeah. He says that He gave Himself a ransom for all. Yeah. Not just some people, everybody. Yeah. It grieves, and I'll say this, you know, we think about that thought that there's more people that are going to go to hell and heaven, and it ought to grieve us. You know, hopefully it, it strikes a chord in our hearts and it, it moves us. And, 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 and uh, you know, it would grieve us, I would hope that thought. But I will say this, as much as it might grieve any of us, it grieves God more. It grieves God far more that there's people going to hell than it does any of us. You know, the Bible says in Job 26, hell is naked before him and destruction hath no covering. I mean, God sees right into hell. He sees it every day. I mean, God created hell for the devil and his angels. God knows the realities of hell better than any of us. And it says in Proverbs 15, Hell and destruction are before the Lord. He sees hell. It's naked. It's before Him. And it grieves Him. That same verse in Proverbs 15, this is a great verse. I love this verse. I think about it often. It says, Hell and destruction are before the Lord. But it goes on and says this, How much more than the hearts of the children of men. You know, God loves the sinner. God loves lost people. And God wants people to be saved. You know, so when Jesus says, broad is the way which leadeth unto destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, that's not something he probably enjoyed saying. But it's something that needs to be said, because that's the fact. Because God's people need to get serious about going out and reaching the lost, learning how to go soul winning, learning how to give the gospel, and making time to do it. Now, obviously, we're not going to get everybody saved. A lot of people are going to reject it. A lot of people aren't going to want to have anything to do with it. But never let it be said it's because we were too whatever to go out and get it done. We were too lazy. We were too busy. We were too unconcerned. You know, maybe we need to just pause and let get hell and destruction before our eyes Lord, and just dwell on that thought. I mean, that should motivate us to go out and see somebody get saved. Now, that's what that verse is teaching. That's what these verses are teaching. But let me very quickly just touch on this before we wrap up. Let me, it is not teaching this. It is not teaching that heaven, getting to heaven is difficult. Yeah. It is not teaching that going to heaven is difficult. You say, why even bring that up? Well, maybe because almost every single modern version, other than the King James, gets, they twist this verse, they change it, and they make it sound like going to heaven is something that is difficult and something that is hard. I'm going to read to you this ver these verses from just a few of these modern versions. <clears throat> the English Standard Version says, For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. That's not what that verse is saying at all. No. It says there, the gate is straight is narrow, and narrow, it, uh, the gate is straight and narrow is the way. It just says it's narrow. It didn't say it's hard. It said it's narrow. There's right. a big difference between a narrow way and a hard way. They're making a it sound it's like you're trying to climb a mountain. Like it's so you have to overcome all these obstacles. Bible says the New King James. It's like, well, it's a King James. It's not. No, it's not the New King James. It deviates from the, the Textus Recepticus multiple times. It's not the same thing as the, as the King James. Yeah. This is a great verse to point out. It says, because this is what the New King James says, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way. Wow. Same thing. They're saying, oh, going to heaven is difficult. Going to heaven is hard. No, it's not. Hard. It's as simple as believing in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it. Amen. That's why we know for God so loved the world. That's why we know that God commended His love toward us. That's why, because He made us, we know that He loves us that much because heaven, going to heaven is a free gift. Yep. Amen. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I mean, how hard is it to receive a gift? I've got several kids. Let me tell you something. It ain't hard. I mean, their birthday comes around, and it's like, where's the gift? <laughs> Get it out, Dad. What are you waiting for? You know? They just got to take it, tear it open, and bam, it's theirs. It's the same way with salvation. It's not difficult. It's not hard. It's not something you have to work for. Salvation is easy. It's not difficult. 
You know, and some of these other ones, like the American Standard Version, they're a little bit more subtle about it. They don't just come out and say, it's hard. They don't just come out and say, it's difficult. I mean, that's pretty blatant, right? So they, they kind of, they just, the devil wised up and got a little more subtle here. He said, uh, it says in the American Standard Version, for narrow is the gate and straightened, past tense, is the way. Meaning it almost sounds like they're saying, well, somebody came along and, and straightened it. Like somebody else made it that way. Like, it's, like God is making it straight on purpose for you to go to heaven, right? And I'm going to get into why he says straight and why it's narrow and straight in many years. And the NIV is kind of the same way. He says, but small is the gate. Small is the gate. Now, I'm kind of a bigger guy, and I don't like trying to go through small things, right? <laughs> That's hard. That's difficult. If you said, hey, Corbin, go climb through that doggy door. I'm going to say, hand me a sawzall, you know, because that's a physical impossibility, right? Because, you know, that name, it's hard to go through something small enough. You said, hey, there's a narrow opening over there. Depending on the opening, you know, it's probably not going to be that difficult for him. But uh, there's a big difference between a straight thing and something that is small. You know, something that is straight, narrow, and something that is a very small way to go through. I mean, that just kind of, it's not as blatant as it's hard, it's difficult, but you can see how they kind of changed it to just make it, kind of put that thought in your mind that it's, it's small, it's been straightened, it's, it's not easy, right? <clears throat> now, what did Jesus say about, about you know, going to heaven? What did he say about coming to him? That it's hard to get to him, that it's difficult, that it's, uh, you know, that it's straightened, that it's a small way to get there? No, he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls. Why? For my yoke is what? Easy. <laughs> and my burden is light. Coming to Christ is easy. Amen. It's light. Because that's how much God loves us. He made it easy. He made it light on purpose. It's man. And, 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 and uh, you know, all these false ways that want to just heap all these different, they want to add to the word of God and add to salvation. Say, yeah, you got to do this. Yeah, you got to do that. Jesus said, it's all by faith. It's, it's, not, it's not of works. It's something that is very easy. It's something that is light. Now, he did say in this passage, though, he did say it was straight, right? He said the way was straight, and he said the way was narrow. Now, why did he say that? Did he say it because he's trying, is it because he's trying to make it hard to get to heaven? No, he says there, if you look there, verse 14, the straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto, unto life. Here's why it's straight and narrow. Because there's few that find it, and few there be that find it. Now... <coughs> He, he says it's, 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 it's narrow because there's few. And one of the best ways I kind of try to illustrate what I, my thought here is this. I was a, uh, I was a locksmith. I worked at the convention center in, in downtown Phoenix. So I had to deal with a lot of fire code when I was working there. I had to deal with a lot of um, you know, large public places. Has anyone ever been to the convention center in downtown Phoenix? Huge facility. I mean, underground, gigantic, thousands of doors. I mean, they could hold tens of thousands of people. In these places, giant halls, just just huge. And uh, what they, what one thing you learn about when you start dealing with life and fire code is what's called uh, means of egress. So a fire marshal will look at a building and he'll say, "This building, I think it's three three square feet per person. That's how they figure it out." They say, "This this space can hold this many people," and then they'll look at how many people could potentially be in that space, and then they'll say, "You need to have this many openings." To, to facilitate that many people having to get out of this building in X amount of seconds. There's a lot of thought that goes into it. It's called means of egress. So when we had, at the convention center, we had these just massive halls. I mean, it would take you like several minutes to walk across them, where it was just one giant hall, and then all around it, on one side, they would just have banks of doors, right? They had big, wide doors. They had a lot of big, wide openings. It was a wide gate that a lot of people could go through at once. So that's why this way is, is narrow, and that's why it's straight, because there, it doesn't need to be big. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be wide, because there's very few people, the Bible says, that actually find it. And the closing thought that I want to leave you with is, well, why is it? Why is it that there's so few people that find it? Why, is the way have to, that why, why can't the way to heaven, wouldn't it be great if it had to be wide? If there were just so many people coming to heaven that he had to say, you know what, why is, why is the gate that comes to the everlasting life. You know, many there be that find it. Wouldn't that be great? That'd be great news. But it's the opposite. The reason why there's few that find it is because there's few that show it. You know, people aren't going to find salvation on their own. They're not just going to stumble upon it. Oh, what's this? Oh, eternal life. 
They're not just going to crack open the Bible and, and get it. You know, someone it's going to take a blood-bought believer to come to them and open up the Word of God and the Spirit of God moving through that person and, and witnessing to them and speaking to their heart to get them to understand the Scriptures and come with saving knowledge of Christ. Amen. The reason why there's few that find it is because there's few people that are going willing to go out and help others find it and show them where it is. You know, it reminds me of what Jesus said when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they were faint and were scattered abroad. I mean, that's that's how we should feel when we see the multitudes in the world that do not know Christ. I mean, we look at the map we have hanging back there of Tucson. All the you know, we're fading, we're we're shading it in as we go through and we knock these doors, trying to knock every door in Phoenix and give everybody at least one chance to hear the gospel. We're doing the same thing in Phoenix. And the res Indian reservations all across the state of Arizona, going out and knocking every single door, trying to give everybody we can the gospel. Why? <coughs> because when we look at the, at the masses, we should be moved with compassion, as Jesus was, mm -hmm. and want to give them an opportunity to know the Savior, to, to know the shepherd, and not to be scattered abroad. <coughs> and he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous. It's not that there aren't multitudes out there. There are. He says, but the laborers are few. That's the lacking. That's why there's so few that find it, because there's so few laborers that are willing to go out there and take the time and the energy to go out and preach the gospel. And I just, you know, we, that, that's the closing thought, is that you know, we should think about that. Do we have the same reaction when we see the multitudes? Because that's something that can wax cold in a Christian's life. It really can. I remember... When I first got saved, I, can, I remember I had this, this, this memory very clearly. I think of it from time to time of uh, just being at the stoplight after I, got, I had just gotten saved and I realized, you know, heaven, hell, how easy salvation was. I was a new believer. And I remember just sitting at the stoplight, this busy intersection, just seeing all these cars go by. Yeah. And I just remember just being moved and just, just like almost to brought to the place of tears, just mm -hmm. thinking, do any of these people that are passing by even know who God is? Yeah. Are they going to go to hell? Are they going to go to heaven? There's nobody telling them, you know, but we can lose that, you know, if, we're not, if we can lose that fire, we can lose that compassion, we can lose that desire to see people saved. And, you know, I want to just stir you up tonight and help and make sure that it doesn't happen, that we don't grow cold in that area and understand that, you know, the way is narrow. Yeah, the way is straight, but, you know, we can still help people find it if we're willing to go out there and preach them the gospel. Let's go ahead and pray.